It's pretty crazy how sex education just like doesn't exist in this country. Um, I think, what is the statistic? Is it like sex ed is only required in what, 13 states or something like that? It's, um, it's a requirement in around half of states. I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but the number of states that require medically accurate sex ed, yeah, it's somewhere around 13 or 14. Um, so, you know, there are some states that require sex ed, but it's like, we don't care what the hell you <laughs> teach people about. Just, you know, teach them something about sex. We don't care if it's useful or accurate or not. What, what do you find that people are teaching people about sex in those situations? Is that... Is that a course where you might get taught about abstinence, like taught that abstinence is the only real method of, say, birth control? Yeah, those are often the just say no courses when it comes mm. to sex, where that's really the only thing they do is a bunch of scare tactics. Like, here's all the bad things that are going to happen if you have sex. You're going to get pregnant and die. And um, they don't teach people. You're going to get pregnant to and die. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> both like it, both are inevitable if you have sex you know that that really is kind of the message that so many of those abstinence courses teach and it's problematic that we don't give adolescents a lot of useful information about sex we don't give them comp comprehensive sex ed for the most part but we also don't do this at other stages of life doctors and physicians people who are going to become sex therapists there's so little sexuality training for all of them and so a lot of us in the field have to be like me and that you're self-taught you have to go out and do the work yourself and find the learning opportunities because no one is out there really providing it and that's part of the reason why after spending 10 years as a full-time academic i transitioned into full-time science communication. So I run a blog and a podcast and I write books and I uh, find other ways of taking the science and research that's out there and helping get it in the hands of people who need to know it and can use it to improve and enhance their sex lives and mm -hmm. relationships. So you mentioned books. Um, let's talk about your latest book, which is Tell Me What You Want, The Science of Sexual Desire and How It Can Improve Your Sex Life. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, what you actually cover in this book? That was a book that was about four years in the making. It was a pretty ambitious book project because I wanted to write a book about the largest and most comprehensive scientific survey of sexual fantasies ever undertaken in the United States. So I spent a couple of years going out and surveying more than 4,000 Americans from all 50 states about their favorite fantasy of all time, as well as hundreds of people, places, and things they might have ever fantasized about. And then I wrote this book looking at not just what are we fantasizing about, but what do our fantasies say about us? So how do your fantasies connect to your personality, your sexual history, your demographic background? Uh, I also look at what's the connection between fantasy and reality? So how many people want to act on their sexual fantasies and how many have actually done so? And what are their experiences like? And what can we learn from them in terms of providing helpful tools to people who might want to incorporate more of their fantasies into their intimate lives? I'm glad you brought that up because I have found that, you know, through talking to so many people um, through this podcast and just in my own experiences that, you know, a lot of people are really ashamed about their fantasies and they're afraid to talk about them because they think it might point to some kind of inner psychological problem. You know, there's a lot of people who have like dark fantasies and, and they're afraid, what does that say about me as a person? Um, what have you found when you talk to people about fan their fantasies and ones that might possibly trouble them? I find that those feelings of shame and guilt and embarrassment are extraordinarily common. Some people are more likely to experience them than others, though. Uh, one thing that I thought was interesting about my data was that men, compared to women, actually reported feeling more shame and guilt about their sexual mm -hmm. fantasies. And that was interesting because, you know, we talk a lot about the sexual double standard and how women are judged more harshly for their sexuality and their sexual behaviors compared to men. But men were actually harboring more feelings of guilt and shame. Now, certainly women have a lot of those feelings as well. 
But what I find is that the more people feel guilt and shame, the less likely they are to engage with their fantasy content. So they run from it. They try to suppress those thoughts sometimes because they're uncomfortable. And they also don't share them with their partners or incorporate them into their sex lives. And the end result is that they experience more psychological distress more sexual difficulties when it comes to performance and arousal. And they also have more relationship problems, more sexual communication issues and conflict in the relationship because they're not really getting what they want when it comes to sex because they don't feel like they can even talk about it. So the people who are doing the best, I find in my work, are the people who have accepted their fantasies for what they are the people who engage with them and who are willing to open up about them with their partners and maybe even act on some of them.